Hi, and welcome to another one of Pythian's Expert Insights, a series dedicated to providing expert knowledge on the bleeding edge of technology. Today, we are joined by one of Pythian's principal consultants, Richard Weiss, to take a look at a cloud last migration roadmap. Hi, today we're going to be talking about creating a framework for migrating an existing on-premise infrastructure to a public cloud provider. My name is Rich Weiss, and I'm a principal consultant at Pythian, and I specialize in SQL Server, Wintel, and cloud technologies. I've been an IT professional for over 20 years, and I feel privileged to have joined the Pythian team about a year ago. Prior to joining Pythian, I spent about 10 years at Western Union as the Director for Global Data Operations, and I've also held senior engineering roles with companies like First Data and AAA. Um, in addition to that, I have the privilege of serving on the Data Standards Committee for the National Retail Foundation, and you can find my blogs and presentations on Pythian.com. Today, I'm excited to be presenting on cloud migration. I'm sure that many of you are aware of how topical the subject of migrating to the cloud is. However, many organizations struggle with planning a cloud, mi cloud migration strategy, and today we're going to talk about how you can create a framework uh, to leverage uh, planning in your existing uh, migration for your existing infrastructure to a cloud provider. However, before we dig into the nitty gritty, I want to spend a few minutes discussing the current IT landscape and its evolution. Over the past 25 years, technology has played an ever increasing role in improving the way that business is done. And while this change has been rapid and continual, we have seen a few major inflection points significant transformations affecting every business. In 1993, organizations began mass adoption of the traditional data center. I'll call it the one-to-one -one data center because by and large, each physical server had a specific function. A web server served web pages, an FTP server uh, received files, database server stored data, so on and so forth. This model really started before 1993, but I chose that year due to the release of Windows NT and the explosion in Wintel computing. Ten years later, in 2003, we entered an age of virtualization, and this allowed organizations to more efficiently utilize their server capacity. And by 2008, hypervisor products had matured and virtualization had achieved mass adoption. Where one physical server once represented a single function, it now represented a collection of servers and services. By 2012, many organizations had begun experimenting with limited public cloud connectivity. This was primarily the result of a couple of industry trends that had coalesced. First, most organizations, which had previously been gaining efficiencies from virtualization, had completed those efforts and reaped the majority of the benefits from consolidation. At the same time, companies like Amazon, Microsoft, Salesforce, and others began heavily investing in and marketing various public cloud products and services. Now, in 2015, we're witnessing the beginning of a sea change where organizations are embracing IT infrastructure convergence and implementing hybrid cloud environments as well as full infrastructure migrations. As public cloud and uh, infrastructure offerings mature and companies like Salesforce, Workforce, and SAP expand their everything-as-a-service product offerings, many organizations are finding that transitioning to a cloud model allows them to most effectively meet their business challenges. Now I'd like to take a look at some of the primary drivers behind this sea change. Just a few decades into this computer revolution, we've ne reached the next major transformation point. It is estimated that every day, 2.5 quintillion bytes of data is created. If you're not familiar with a quintillion, that is a one followed by 18 zeros. Or to put it another way, that's 2.5 million terabytes of data created daily. This means that approximately 90% of all electronic data has been created in just the past two years. Another astonishing number is that over two billion internet connected mobile devices shipped last year alone. And Cisco estimates that by the end of next year, 62% of all total enterprise workloads will reside in the cloud. Contributing to this rapid adoption of the cloud is the fact that over 75 billion devices will be connected to the internet within the next five years. 
Now that number seems astounding, but it's really incredible how quickly this, this sea change has taken place. As a matter of fact, I upgraded my personal home router last week, and when I upgraded the router, it said that I had 21 connected internet devices in my home. At first I thought possibly it was a mistake or that there was some sort of hack taking place on my router, but when I dug into the technical information of what devices were connected, I realized that I had several TVs that were connected to the internet, I have a thermostat that's connected to the internet, and a multitude of internet connected devices and tablets and PCs. So it is just incredible how rapid this connected transformation has, has taken place. And because the world is changing so fast, many of the traditional IT paradigms that we've depended on in enterprise IT are broken. Uh, in fact, IDC estimates that on average, IT departments are spending 70% of their budgets simply maintaining existing infrastructure and only about 30% on new innovation. In the industry, this has come to be refer referred to as the 70% maintenance loop. Additionally, Forrester estimates that new on-premise initiatives in mid to large enterprises can have long infrastructure lead times of four to six months, and fully two-thirds of those organizations find beho find, fall behind projected schedules when establishing these new infrastructures. To combat many of these issues, I, many IT departments are establishing cloud architectures. In fact, Gartner estimates that 50% of large enterprises will leverage hybrid cloud deployments within two years, and 85% of new software developed right now is either developed as cloud-first or cloud-only platforms. Finally, it's estimated, to under, it's estimated that almost 50% of all IT spending will occur in the cloud within the next five years. To better understand why leveraging the public cloud model can address many of these challenges, Let's take a look at some of the key adoption drivers. One of the primary adoption drivers for cloud technology is business agility. Leveraging public cloud resources results in a reduced time to market. This is accomplished in part by eliminating infrastructure complications and providing self-service provisioning and elastic resources throughout the software development lifecycle all the way into production implementation. Leveraging a public cloud significantly reduces and in some cases eliminates the need for capital expenditure outlays. It also allows for a more predictable budgeting process and it allows IT departments to transition into an OPEX model and this is attractive for many organizations. Placing your infrastructure and your services geographically closer to the end user ultimately results in an improved consumer experience. Additionally, application availability is generally improved within the cloud infrastructure over traditional on-premise service models. This also helps contribute to a better experience to, for the consumer. Public cloud providers offer products and services that would be impractical or impossible for organizations to implement on their own. Some examples of these uh, services would be geographically distributed content delivery networks, machine learning, and on-demand big data services. Finally, public cloud offers risk mitigation and compliance opportunities. And what I mean by that is that in many ways, you're outsourcing aspects of your infrastructure to the public cloud provider. In essence, you're sharing the responsibility for maintaining compliance within that infrastructure with the public cloud provider. For organizations who are contractually bound from leveraging public cloud to host segments of your infrastructure, you have the option of implementing a hybrid cloud architecture. The hybrid model reduces your barrier to entry by providing your organization with the flexibility to maintain sensitive systems on premises while leveraging the public cloud infrastructure for applicable products and services. And finally, the public cloud may enable you to meet data sovereignty challenges by leveraging diverse cloud regions to store global, globally regional specific data. KPMG conducted a survey in January which concluded that although cost efficiency is still the top adoption driver, reduced time to market, new product development, and mobile workforce enablement are all major benefits to cloud adoption. Up to this point, I think we've discussed some very compelling reasons why cloud adoption is becoming extremely attractive to many organizations 
and why implementing a cloud strategy now has become a priority for many enterprises. However, I think it is important to understand some of the major concerns that organizations have when considering leveraging cloud services. Of course, anyone who has ever researched a cloud solution has likely heard an overwhelming amount of negativity regarding security and, security and compliance. Organizations are concerned about security for data at rest, data in transit, data separation, user access, uh, insecure APIs, the, the list goes on and on. And these are all genuine concerns, whether you're deploying to a cloud provider or to an on-premise facility. In fact, many of these security concerns around public cloud have less to do with the infrastructure co constructs and more to do with a lack of internal policy creation or an enforcement of those policies for internal IT staff members. And this is because the cloud enables your organization to provision and deploy so rapidly that IT governance becomes a far more important concern. In fact, just recently an existing client contacted me because their organization was performing a POC with a club, public cloud provider. And he was experiencing some performance issues with a database server that he created and asked me to take a look. Well, immediately after connecting to the server, I noticed that the error log had tens of thousands of authentication rejection from every commonly used user ID and password combination, SA, root, god, sysadmin, uh, and essentially what had happened was this individual had provisioned his server to be completely accessible over the public internet. Now, of course, that is a security issue and, and, and not a desired situation. But the real question is, is that a fundamental issue with the cloud platform? Or is that an IT governance issue within that specific organization? So it's those types of governance policies and control mechanisms that really require a significant amount of thought and planning when considering your cloud architecture. Some of the other major concerns noted in the survey are concerns about immature infrastructures. And for anyone who's familiar with the public cloud platform and has worked with it directly, I'm sure you've encountered your fair share of bugs. And, and that's what comes when uh, numerous vendors are competing in a rapidly changing market and the platform is just not quite as mature as you would expect from enterprise class software. Uh, there are, of course, concerns around performance and outages. Um, con um, companies have concerns around being subject to pricing changes and vendor lock-in. And these are all con valid concerns. And an in-depth exploration of these challenges is beyond the scope of this specific presentation. But you certainly do need to be cognizant of these concerns when planning a cloud deployment. Now I'd like to take a look at the public cloud landscape. <clears throat> Taking a quick look at the infrastructure landscape, we can see that Amazon is the current market leader in this segment with almost a 30% share, while Microsoft remains in second place with an 11% share. However, as you can see, Microsoft does have the fastest growth rate in this segment. Many other providers are getting into this space, and it's very competitive. Recently, Google has been making a big push with a number of big data and analytics products. Uh, IBM has been making a big push into this space, acquiring SoftLayer last year and attempting to position itself with unique cloud offerings and bare metal cloud options. And of course, Salesforce owns the software as a service market with its product suite. Just about every other vendor is attempting to get a piece of this market. Um, Oracle Cloud will soon be making a large expansion. Uh, VMware has announced a number of interesting products and changes with its VR Cloud platform. Uh, Rackspace, Workday, HP, uh, and most of the major IT vendors are really trying to get into this space now. So it's a very competitive market segment. Uh, but as you can see, Amazon uh, is far and away the top leader in this space uh, at the time, at this time. Now that we understand how we got to this point in time, who some of the market leaders are and what the adoption drivers and detractors are, let's talk about how we go about creating a framework for migrating our existing infrastructure to a cloud platform. Before we delve deep into the migration framework, I think it's important that you understand a few key concepts and some of the terminology used within the framework. When considering a cloud initiative, there are three primary models that you can consider. 
The first one is a public cloud provider. And these are, um, these are platforms such as Microsoft's Azure and Amazon, and they provide infrastructure as a service offerings with self-service, scalability, multi-tenancy, uh, the ability to provision machines and change computing resources on demand, and they'll also provide um, things like chargeback tools to track computing usage, uh, and business units typically only pay for the resources that they utilize. Additionally, they'll offer a plethora of platform as a service offerings, such as big data management and analytics, as well as some software as a service products that many organizations choose to leverage to either replace or enhance their existing on-premise applications. The second type is a private cloud. And private cloud of computing is a type of cloud computing that can deliver similar advantages to the public cloud, including scalability and self-service provisioning, uh, but through a proprietary architecture. Unlike public clouds, which deliver services to multiple organizations, a private cloud is dedicated to a single organization. And this can be achieved by transforming your existing infrastructure, leveraging software such as OpenStack, or via numerous vendors' products such as Rackspace. It's important to note that if you're simply running VMware with a self-provisioning portal, that's not truly a cloud-capable architecture. That's more like a VMware vending machine. And finally, we have a hybrid model. A hybrid model is simply the integration of multiple models. Um, and more often than not, the hybrid model is the gateway model leveraged by many organizations before fully committing to a cloud-only or cloud-first infrastructure. A hybrid topology can be as simple as sticking a presentation layer in a cloud provider, uh, which then integrates with your existing on-prem infrastructure, or it can also be a very complex topology that integrates servers and services from multiple cloud providers into multiple on-premise and co-location facilities. Now I'd like to share with you the migration framework that I leverage when I'm planning a cloud initiative. I segment this framework into five major transformation phases. Shown here is an overview of these phases, and in subsequent slides, we'll dig a little further into each one in more detail. Phase one is the assessment phase, and this is our primary analysis and planning phase. This is where we perform in infrastructure architecture discovery. We'll take a complete inventory of all our IT assets. We'll identify all our applications and dependencies, and we perform a classification process for applications and components. We will attempt to identify target cloud providers and services, and this is also the phase where we'll create some initial costing projections and perform some analysis on the cost model. Additionally, we'll create an initial skeletal roadmap for the project. Phase two is the proof of concept phase, and this is where we start implementing POC testing and validation. And validation includes um, validation for performance, migration methodologies, security testing, and in this phase is also where we'll select the final methods, vendors, and platforms that we've chosen as a result of the POC process, and then finalize the costing projections and roadmap. Phase three is our build phase, and this is actually the phase in which we build out our new infrastructure. We will build out our networking and authentication components, um, we will build out the uh, server infrastructure, we'll provision uh, storage and cloud services, we'll implement our monitoring construct, and we'll do this for every cloud vendor and applicable region targeted. Phase four is our migration implementation phase. And this is actually the phase where we begin moving data and applications and services to our target infrastructures. Typically, after a number of mock migrations, organizations begin the or typically after a number of mock migrations, organizations begin the process by moving their non-production environments first and then applying those lessons learned from the migration to their final uh, production implementations. And finally, the last phase is optimization. And this phase is actually occurs post-migration. Once you already migrated to the cloud, and that's because some organizations migrating to the cloud, particularly for those utilizing a forklift approach where all significant infrastructure components are transitioned as is, they can't or they won't explore many of the additional benefits of cloud hosting until after the migration has been performed. 
As an example, an organization may choose to forklift move its database systems to equivalent cloud-based VMs, therefore postponing the discovery process for leveraging that cloud provider's database as a service platform until after the migration has been completed. And this is done in order to simplify the cloud transition effort. In this phase, we explore those types of optimizations opportunities, as well as exploring further consolidation and cost savings approaches. So starting with our migration timeline, phase one is our analysis and planning phase. And this phase is actually broken into four segments. The first segment of phase one, we classify applications and we define the requirements for each one of those applications. So the things we're looking at is what type of applications are we hosting in our environment? We're looking to make a complete inventory of this. Are they consumer facing? Are they client facing? Uh, do we have internal business applications, our ERP, CRM? Uh, are we leveraging any existing cloud services now? What are the uh, disaster recovery and what are the SLA requirements for each and every application? What are the compliance considerations for data residency, uh, HIPAA, PCI for each and every application? And that's what we look at in the first segment of phase one. In the next segment of phase one, we assess our current infrastructure. What do we have now? and what are we going to need when we migrate to the cloud. So we'll look at things like what is our current network architecture, what's the current network utilization, uh, what are our current authentication mechanisms, and when we move to the cloud, are we going to tie that back to the on-premise facilities? If so, how would that be accomplished? What are our compute requirements? So what operating systems do we need? Are they even available at Cloud Provider X? Um, do all our operating systems meet current compliance regulations? Uh, what are our storage requirements? What do we need in terms of capacity? Uh, what do we need in terms of performance, in terms of IOPS? Do we require data deduplication? Do we require compression? Um, what are we licensed for uh, as far as third-party products on-premises? And do we have license mobility to move those uh, applications and services to the cloud. Uh, some products uh, can easily be leveraged, can easily be migrated to the cloud uh, via uh, license mobility, and other products require additional license kits, keys, and purchases in order to host in a public cloud provider. We'll look at what are our external integration and dependency requirements. We may screen scrape a mainframe terminal over a dedicated circuit. How is that going to work when we migrate to the cloud? Uh, what are our infrastructure level H, uh, high availability and disaster recovery requirements? And what do they need to be in the cloud? Do we have on-premise server-side telco circuits and hard cards? How is that going to work when we go to the cloud? Do we have specialty hardware, servers with hard dongles or servers with uh, cryptographic cards or math coprocessing cards? How are those going to work when we migrate to the cloud? These are just some of the many items that you'll need to consider in this phase. The next segment of phase one is to identify target platforms and perform costing estimations and analysis. So once we've com completed the first, two phase, the first two segments of phase one, which is essentially a discovery process for our applications and infrastructures, we need to begin theoretically mapping our requirements to what offerings the cloud providers have. This will allow us to eliminate some potential providers immediately and focus our efforts on a narrow set of selected providers. It is entirely possible that you may have more than one cloud provider that you wish to move to a POC phase with. At this point, you'll likely have a good sense as to, which, as to whether you want to establish a hybrid architecture. Uh, your organization may wish to investigate any upfront application or replacement or replatforming opportunities, and we'll review the costs and capabilities for things like dedicated provider circuits. Um, we'll need to perform a detailed costing analysis. Now, methodologies for this vary by organization, use case, and complexity, and this topic alone could encompass an entire presentation. However, it's obviously something that needs to be addressed early on in the process. Uh, so it's something that you'll need to think about up front. Um, you'll need to consider your existing co-locations and facilities contracts and obligations. Uh, you'll need to consider your current staff skill set as well as training and vendor assistance, which may be required. And in the final segment of phase one, 
you'll begin actually examining your migration process considerations. And what I mean by that is, so what is your desired timeline for the migration and for what components? What approach do you wish to take in order to perform the migration? Are you going to use a forklift approach, a hybrid approach, or, or something in between? What tools and or vendors will you evaluate in order to facilitate the migration process? What are you going to do with outlier systems and or applications that simply can't be migrated to the cloud? We're going to define a scope for the POC and identify a series of success criteria. And we're also going to create an initial kind of skeletal roadmap for the migration initiative. Moving on to phase two, this is our proof of concept and roadmap phase. And in phase two, we actually begin implementing all of our proof of concept initiatives. Typically, we begin implementing by establishing all the required connectivity constructs, uh, the communication circuits for all our different cloud providers in scope. We'll perform all the requisite functional performance and security testing and ensure that we meet all our established um, success criteria within the POC. We'll gather all our feedback from our various test beds, POCs, business divisions, uh, and we'll choose our winners and losers for the cloud platforms, for vendors, and for services and tools. And maybe, the most, and maybe at this time, the most important thing that we do is we take this opportunity to course correct. Moving to the cloud can be a significant undertaking, and all the pre-POC planning in the world may not reveal the pitfalls and the unexpected challenges that you're likely to encounter. It's important at this juncture to be able to pivot and to reevaluate the roadmap. It is entirely possible you may determine that cloud options simply don't fit your organization's needs at this time, and you may choose to put the project on the shelf. However, if you do decide to move forward, you will utilize all the POC findings to finalize your project roadmap and continue along our cloud journey. Phase three is our build phase. And by the time we've arrived at phase three, we know that where we're going, we know which public cloud providers we've identified, what vendors we've identified, what tools and methods we've identified. We think we know how much it's going to cost, and we have a rough idea of how long the migration is actually going to take. Uh, and we've created um, a detailed project roadmap. Now it's time for us to actually build our new infrastructure. And this is typically done by starting by defining the uh, network infrastructure and the IP ranges. Uh, we will define and implement all our network security layers and devices, all our firewalls, VPNs, things of that nature. Uh, we'll have to provision our authentication and backbone mechanisms, uh, things like Active Directory and DNS. Um, we will pre-build all of our um, infrastructure as a service component, so all our servers and components that we need uh, to host the infrastructure uh, prior to migration, we'll have to pre-build them in this phase. Um, in addition to pre-building them in our primary region, we'll have to ensure that all failover and secondary regions for cloud provider or providers are also configured and integrated into the infrastructure as necessary. We'll have to do things like provisioning all our required blob storage and services, uh, create and deploy monitoring constructs. Uh, and I think that once we're done with our base infrastructure, it's important at this point uh, to enlist a third-party provider to conduct penetration testing before we even begin moving data and applications into our infrastructure. And finally, we're going to build our actual migration plan for data applications and services. So how are we actually going to migrate all of our production artifacts into the cloud infrastructure we've just constructed with a minimal impact to our current business? Moving along to phase four, this is the migration phase. And this phase is actually known as the phase where someone is most likely to get fired. And I say that because this is the phase where a lot of different things can go wrong in our migration uh, journey. Um, in this phase, we're actually going to expand on and harden our migration plan and actually execute it. Um, so we're going to execute our migration plan in this phase, and hopefully we're not going to um, uh, execute our rollback plan. There are a few keys that I believe are paramount to success for completing a cloud migration. The first key is open communication and collaboration with business stakeholders. 
And this is absolutely essential during the process for numerous reasons. But the most important may be is that it, it's more than likely going to happen during the migration effort that you will experience some bumps in the road and some unexpected outcomes. So establishing a partnership with stakeholders and keeping them well informed throughout the process is going to mitigate some of the repercussions from any hiccups you may encounter during the process. The second key is to perform as many mock migrations as possible and to hold kind of what if brainstorming sessions in order to plan for contingencies for any conceivable scenario. And the third key is to move non-production environments first if at all feasible and then apply those lessons learned to the actual production migrations. Additionally, after the production migration has been completed, you'll want to immediately begin trending performance and collecting exception data in order to compare that data with previously known on-prem baselines. This way you're able to investigate anomalies and proactively address any concerns. And now we've arrived at our final phase, optimization. And this phase actually occurs after you have completed the migration effort. And this is actually the fun phase. This is where we have the opportunity to really leverage some of the benefits of the cloud platform that were not available to us in our on-premise facility. This is where we start to explore cloud optimization avenues that we may have deferred until after the migration was completed. We will reevaluate all the replatforming opportunities for various platforms and databases of service candidate systems. We may even look at replacing systems with public cloud provider software as a service systems. We'll integrate all our monitoring and feedback systems in order to optimize performance within the cloud infrastructure. We will identify dynamic cost savings opportunities. You may have different performance tier requirements for different systems at different periods of the day, week, or month. Uh, the cloud, the public cloud, uh, will allow us to now dynamically adjust our infrastructure accordingly in order to realize the cost savings provided by a pay-per-use model. Additionally, we can leverage available cloud automation systems to improve the velocity and quality of our internal infrastructure processes and to increase operational visibility into our environment. So that concludes the five phases of the migration framework, but like any good infomercial, there's a little more. <laughs> I have some additional tips to success uh, that, that you will want to look at along your cloud journey. The first one is to engage potential cloud providers early in the process. Competition is robust among cloud platform providers now, and significant financial incentives may be available to your organization based on commitment levels to a cloud provider's platform. It sounds crazy, but your current data center provider may actually help you migrate from their current from your current infrastructure with that provider to a cloud platform. In fact, Amazon just recently announced a deal uh, with Amazon, uh, excuse me, Rackspace just recently announced a deal with Amazon to provide tools and services to assist customers in migrating to the cloud. Now you may ask why would they do that? Well, part of the incentive for them is that they are attempting to acquire your managed services business. They would rather keep a segment of your business than lose you entirely. The next tip is that a migration effort can be a very, very large and complex undertaking. It's important to get a trusted third-party opinion on your migration roadmap and plan. It's like insurance for IT stakeholders. I say don't force a square peg in a round hole. And what I mean by that is that not every application is a viable cloud candidate at this time. Some systems are simply too sensitive to performance demands to make good cloud, cloud platform candidates. Cloud platforms have come a very long way in a short period of time, but highly performant revenue generating systems may not be ideal candidates for cloud replatforming now or even in the near future. Finally, get your house in order before attempting a migration. And what I mean by that is that you may not choose to optimize every application or system prior to migration, but if you are aware of junk in the IT environment, 
things like obsolete data systems, um, half completed consolidation efforts, uh, things of that nature. It would benefit you from a financial and from a workload standpoint to clean up those issues before migration. If you're moving to a new house, you don't take the old trash and the broken furniture with you, and the same principle applies to a cloud migration effort. So that concludes today's presentation. I hope that you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them at this time, or you can feel free to send me an email at weiss at pythian.com, and I would be more than happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today and taking the time to watch one of our expert insights. Remember, you can connect with Richard using the information provided here, and if you want to discover more about our expertise in the cloud, Visit the URL provided at the bottom of the page here or email us at info at Thanks for watching.